Thanks, Tyler. That was great. I, I wish I um, had known. I forgot about Vegas. Uh, uh, I have some great pictures, and I'm not talking about the casinos. Uh, they have built the biggest uh, solar thermal electric facility. So if, if I manage to get through what I prepare, I'll show you some pictures. But it really blows your mind up. Um, as Josipa was saying earlier, it was uh, Barack Obama uh, that was behind the uh, you know, revolution in electric vehicles in the US and to an extent in Canada. Um, and he's also been behind the revolution on renewable energy. Very few people know this, but the United States is now uh, only second to China, believe it or not. China is the biggest renewable energy place in the world. Um, but the States is doing uh, very amazing things. This uh, plant outside of uh, Vegas that we went to see, it's full of mirrors that follow the sun. Um, it'll blow you away. And they make the mirrors right there on the spot. Um, but um, I want to start by thanking uh, the friends that I've made here in Oxford can uh, County. I mean, Peter, uh, thanks for inviting me. Tyler, uh, David Mulberry, um, and my friend Trevor Birch. Uh, with Trevor and Tyler, uh, we went to Vancouver, and we had the pleasure to meet uh, the mayor of Vancouver. Uh, and I say to these two mayors, it's good that you're meeting each other because you're the two coolest mayors in Canada. Uh, and they laugh about it, but then they start sharing experience and they realize, yeah, you're pretty cool, Trevor. Uh, and uh, he said to the mayor of Vancouver, you're not bad yourself. And um, these two mayors are actually pushing the envelope uh, on what we should be doing um, in this uh, world, uh, which is to bring to reality the change we want to see um, here in, in real life. Um, and, um, you know, I had to choose the title of my presentation. And I started with what I was given, Future Oxford. And that made me think a little bit about what I should call my presentation. So I started with Future Oxford. And then I switched it to Build It and They Will Come. Thought it was a good title. Um, and then I went for uh, Build It and You Will Prosper. Um, and um, then I thought Build It and You Will Lead. So this presentation has four titles because I'm going to try to uh, provide you uh, some perspectives on four different areas that are deeply, deeply connected. So then when I was doing the research to prepare to talk, I found this great picture uh, of uh, Main Street Woodstock, you know? And I keep thinking, if you had asked these fellows there in the chariots, you know, tending to the horses, what would 2016 look like? Um, and we could tell them that we are going to have electric vehicles like the one where uh, Trevor and Jay are sitting behind you, there's an electric vehicle, um, and that we can power those with renewable energy, and that we can have little boxes that tell us where to go, and we get lost thanks to the boxes, and we can date through the boxes and do all kinds of, people would have thought, whoa, what, I what have you been drinking, um, let alone what you've been smoking? And um, then, uh, I asked myself, I, I saw this beautiful picture, and I, um, I, I really like it. It's sort of what, what we're trying to do, you know? Um, and this is the interactive part of my talk. I, I, I know this is going to sound a little hippy-dippy, but if you could close your eyes for about 30 seconds, I'll make sure nobody pokes you or anything, um, and think about a couple of words that would summarize your feelings of what type of future you would like to have here in Oxford County, you know? And we'll go around the room quickly to those of you that are brave enough to tell us. But just think words that could encompass how you would feel about the future you want to see here. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep the time. Just close your eyes. It's, it's OK. We won't make fun. 30 seconds, starting right now. OK, I hope you didn't fall asleep. Or if you did fall asleep, I hope you're enjoying your sleep. And um, now, anybody wants to say what came to your mind about the future? Uh, any brave souls? Michael. OK. Could everybody hear that? So anybody else uh, that? Profound, comfortable change. Um, anybody else? What was that? Train? More, train? More trains. Smart move. Powered by renewable energy, I would add. 
Um, anybody else that wants to venture their thoughts about the future? You see, I can see a dad there in the back with a little son. So what do you think, sir? What, what do you expect? Common sense. Common sense. All right. Yes, sir? I hope you could hear that because it was a nice vision. Um, I, I don't want to push, and I work in a classroom a lot, and I know that people sometimes don't feel comfortable talking. So what I did is then I posed a sentence to myself, right? What does a sustainable Oxford County look like? And I came up with four things that I want to share with you. I like that one. Uh, I don't like to be cliche, but peace and good government. This is the color of the Canadian flag. I'm Canadian by choice, very proud to be Canadian because of that fact. We appreciate in this country peace and good government, and I hope the future that is what our country and uh, Oxford County in particular would continue to have. I think with uh, folks like David and Trevor, you do have uh, both peace and good government. Then clean environment, which is in a way what you were talking about, right? Uh, so we're on the same page on that one. And then I thought about something that we don't speak too often, uh, at least environmentalists don't, which is good jobs. You know, good jobs are essential to be able to be uh, in peace. And at the end, uh, to, to me at least, I could have put happy families, but then if you're single, you may feel a little excluded. But happy citizens, you know, being happy to be here and uh, if you can wake up in the future and you're a young person now, say, you know what, I could have gone to Paris or to Rome or to New York, but I want to stay here because um, I, I can live a happy life here. To me, that's, that's really important. And I want to start my talk talking about these things um, because my, my specialty is on renewables and we do have a campaign on 100% renewables. Uh, and I will speak now more about renewable energy, but I want you to keep in mind those four themes uh, inform everything that I'm gonna say to you. Um, the suggestions, the gl glimpse that I'm providing of the future uh, are based on the present. Uh, because, you know, to have uh, dreams, it's great, but also you need points of reference to make it possible. Um, and we have this campaign and it's based on this idea, you know, that. 100% renewable energy is possible, um, it's advisable, and it's also imperative. Uh, the fact is, is, if we don't get our act together as humanity uh, to make sure that our energy does not kill us, and that's what in essence it's doing right now, the dependence on fossil fuels and nuclear power. It's creating a toxic legacy for present and future generations. And for those of you that have heard me talk in the past, you may have seen this this is what guides our campaign internationally. Uh, we're trying to um, uh, make sure that we do these four things. Um, different countries, different cities, different counties, different municipalities are at different levels of, of development. Um, but these are the four things that, um, in our opinion, as the people that are part of the campaign, it's what motivates how we interact with uh, the private sector, politicians, etc. Um, and that's sort of the roadmap to build this campaign. Since I saw you <clears throat> last, uh, I spoke here uh, a while ago, um, we did something very, very important. We got together with a bunch of scholars from coast to coast, um, and uh, we were uh, trying to provide uh, all levels of government, federal, municipal, provincial, with ideas based on our co collective expertise as scholars on how to address climate change. Um, and I can tell you that uh, we put forward a number of ideas that then we brought to Montreal and gave it to politicians and decision makers that came uh, to hear us talk. And we gave them a copy of this. You can get the uh, uh, publication from the internet free of charge. And I can tell you that the number uh, one uh, was we need to price carbon. You know, we need to have a price of carbon, otherwise decision making becomes skewed towards not paying attention to it. Not rocket science, as Josipa say. The second one was that uh, Canada has to go 100% renewable energy. Um, and it's not as complicated as people make it to be. Uh, our country right now gets 60% of its electricity from existing hydroelectric facilities. So what we need to do is to make sure that we connect all the provinces in a cooperative manner 
Um, and then we can make sure that the remaining 40% comes from renewables, wind power, solar, et cetera. Um, so we can do it, um, and we're in a very privileged position compared to other countries. Our country is the second biggest country in the world. We got every resource, renewable uh, and non-renewable. Um, and, um, you know, we only have, compared to the states, a ten tenth of the population. So I'm not going to go into detail, but this is the research we're working on uh, with a professor from the United States, uh, from Stanford. And uh, basically, that's what we think the mix would look like in 2050. Um, and the most important thing that I want to mention to you is uh, the job creation engine of this. Um, and a lot of what I'll talk today has to do with job creation. Um, so just to uh, review what we've achieved so far, I mentioned that we were with uh, Trevor, Jay, actually you said it, Tyler. Uh, we met in Vancouver um, under the auspice of the mayor there in a big, big conference to celebrate the fact that Vancouver became the first city in uh, Canada to, go a, to decide to go 100% renewable energy. And here uh, they already have a plan, and I can tell you about the plan. But to me, this is what matters the most. Uh, Oxford County became the first Ontario municipality um, or government to set a 100% renewable energy target. Um, don't believe me, ask Bruce from the Woodstock Sentinel. Um, he wrote that piece. And this is a photo that is very, very uh, dear to my heart. When I'm a very old man, I'm going to look back at this photo uh, you can see that Trevor had the long hair, uh, and we can discuss short hair, long hair. But the point is, this is a historic photo because it's when we began this journey together um, to, to create a better future. Um, and you can see David's there wearing a red tie. You can see Jay, um, Tyler, uh, Mary, and Helmut. We're all in this picture. So to me, this is going to be something I'm going to look back decades into the future. Because I came to tell you something today. I want to make uh, this possible and help you make it possible. Um, I'm not going to quit my job at York University because I'm a tenured professor. And I'm in a very good position there to recruit uh, students, PhD students, postdoctoral students, masters, undergraduates. So I, can, I have access to an international workforce that I can bring it to you. And we've done this already. Uh, asked Trevor about the Costa Rican, Chilean, uh, Indian students that we brought here. In fact, there's one Chilean student, engineering student, that I can't see him right now, uh, Bastian, that is here. And if I have time, I'll tell you the story of what Bastian has done with the knowledge he's gained in Oxford County and in Canada. He's brought it back to Chile and created a, a company with some colleagues of him, and they're doing very well uh, doing solar installations. So then um, we created a campaign uh, that uh, a lot of the people in this room have supported in many ways. Um, and I, I love this, if you pay attention, it's 100% renewable by 2050. And the, the birds move a little bit, and it, it becomes, we are able by 2050. And then we did a, a big conference uh, meeting where we showed movies that were made by a group of uh, young people from an environmental visual communications program. And we made it in steam whistle brewing. Uh, our life is really difficult, right? We, we could have chosen any venue in Toronto, and we chose steam whistle. And the reason why, I'm not advertising for steam whistle, but the reason why we chose that place was the beer's good, but they donate 10% uh, of their monies to environmental causes. So they are walking the walk and talking the talk. So we thought this is a place that encompasses everything that we're trying to do. Um, and um, I want to talk to you briefly about the work uh, that we've done so far for Oxford County. <clears throat> of course, I'm a, a researcher, a trainer. So I've been focusing on this, on training. So what I did for, for you, for your community, is I went to Germany, and Bastian actually met me there in uh, uh, Husum, Germany, and we went to talk to a company called BZEE. -E. Don't ask me what it means in German, because it's a word like this big. But they are the people that do the training of wind technicians in Germany on behalf of the German government. They got a great program. 
uh, unemployed Germans that want to go back to the workforce, uh, that want to work on renewable energy, they get trained by these people uh, on how to do uh, wind installations, wind maintenance, great program. Um, and also, we've been talking uh, very closely to Solar Energy International, and this guy, Bastian, is lucky. Uh, so is Ryan, another student that came today, uh, master students from York, that they went to Colorado to train with Solar Energy International. And that was uh, for their own benefit, because they want to become solar uh, experts. But also, for me, I wanted to get firsthand experience from young people about the good quality of this program. Because, you know, as a professor, you see things like that. As a student, you see them from here. You combine the views and what people are telling you, and you come up closer to reality. Believe me, this is the best program of its kind in the world, Solar Energy International. And uh, both BZEE and Solar Energy International are willing to partner with us here in Oxford County to make sure that Oxford County becomes a hub where people can learn how to do by doing. You're about to build a wind farm. Excellent learning opportunity. Um, but then also, if you plan it right, that wind farm can become a training facility in perpetuity. Because the business of renewables, it's about making the machines and installing them and designing them. So learning by doing is essential. And I'm very proud to tell you that we just graduated the first masters on renewable energy. Uh, not on renewable energy, we've done quite a few on that topic, but on 100% renewable energy. Um, and I'll talk to you a couple of minutes uh, about that. So in terms of training, here you can see uh, the basis of the BZEE training is to get people on the machines. You can see that photo, you're standing at about 100 meters of altitude. Um, you need to have guts to be a wind technician and not be afraid of heights. If you're afraid of heights, good luck to you. Because, and that's how they test people. They say, okay, you wanna climb that wind turbine? And 10 Germans will go, and three would say, nine, Dankeschen of Bidensen. I will not climb a 100 meter tower. Then out of the seven that climb, uh, two or three come down and say, never again. So they end with the very best the people that are really, really good. And the basis of it is to create these training towers that are a little shorter than the regular uh, training towers. And we need to find out a way to get you one of these training towers in the Oxford Wind Co-op. That's the job I've been doing. The people from BZE have agreed to partner with us. St. Lawrence College in Kingston, which is the official partner of BZE, says, yes, we can talk about this. So let's talk about it. Solar Energy International, already I told you a little bit, and this is uh, where they do their training. And uh, these are Bastian's picture, and you can see Bastian is right there. I'm not sure if you, Ryan, are there. Ah, Ryan is right there too, so if you want to see, oh yeah, Ryan's this way. And if you want to see them in live, they're right there. <laughs> so ask them what they think of the program, not me. Um, and it's very much based on, on, on these, uh, oh look, I found a pointer, wonderful. Okay, so in terms of uh, the first masters of uh, renewable energy, for those of 100% renewable energy, um, the student, her name is Kathy, um, and I'm happy to tell you that Friday she passed her oral examination uh, with flying colors, and uh, she's moved to Stanford. She's in California now. Hopefully, she'll do a PhD with Mark Jacobson on 100% renewable energy. But in essence, what she's uh, written is the most definitive piece of, of work right now uh, on how to do these things from a municipal perspective. And I realize there's people from different walks on life here. If you're interested in the findings, let me know. I have two slides with 10 findings, but I'm not gonna show them right now because I'm at 17 minutes and it's 2.30, and I think I need to be done by three. So do ask me if you want that, but there's a really nice drawing uh, of, of what she's talking about. I mean, to close the gap on, on, on planning for 100% renewable energy, you need to have forward thinking, you need to collaborate, you need to have good planning and you have to have effective policy frameworks. And she's got 10 
uh, she has derived 10 principles looking at all the international and national experience, and I'm happy to talk about that. I mentioned to you uh, Mark Jacobson, and Mark uh, got quoted on um, uh, the Global Mail right after the climate negotiations in uh, Paris. Um, and I know Jay, Trevor, uh, and Tyler, you had the chance to meet uh, Professor Jacobson in Vancouver, um, and he is our ally. Uh, this is a guy that is doing the plans for every United States state and pretty much every country in the world. Um, and this is the data that was quoted on the Global Mail, and you can see it's not the same data I show you, because we took Professor Jacobson's work and start looking at what is the role of storage on all of these. And um, I can tell you a little bit more about that, but what I'm trying to do right now is tell you about things that have happened in the present up to this point. Um, so you may remember the climate negotiations in Paris. Um, during those climate negotiations, a lot of people thought the French were gonna cancel the climate negotiations because of the uh, terrorist attacks, the horrible things that happened in their country. And you gotta hand it to the French. They're gutsy people. Um, they say, no, we will prevail. We're not gonna let these people um, terrorize us. And uh, we will do this is important. And I don't know if you know this, but the anecdote is that because of the terrorist attacks, there was a ban on public gatherings in Paris at the time. However, they made one exemption. You're looking at a picture of the one exemption. They allow people to do a demo in front of the uh, Tour Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower. And these are all people standing up. They were all delegates on the climate negotiations. 100% renewable energy has become uh, now the strategy for climate mitigation worldwide. Um, and we also had very unusual new allies come uh, to Paris. Uh, I don't know if you know this guy, but while people were outside uh, doing the 100% uh, renewable energy sign, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was talking to people inside and he said, and I'll have to read it with a Leo DiCaprio accent. To all the mayors and governors in this room, it's Spanish Leo DiCaprio, to all the mayors and governors in this room, commit to moving to no less than 100% renewable energy as soon as possible. Don't wait another day. And for those of you that are going, why Leo DiCaprio? What does he have to do? Um, Leo DiCaprio, since as far as back uh, as 2003, has been the head of a foundation that looks at climate mitigation. Um, and we were able in the campaign to approach him and say, Leo, I mean, you're working on uh, climate change. You know, the solution to climate change is renewables. We need you to speak about this. And he said, yep, got himself in a plane and went, because it's Leo DiCaprio, gets the best meetings. Um, and um, a lot of people are now uh, aware that this campaign exists. I don't like dropping names, that's not my strategy, but it means that the type of things that you do here, this is the type of people that are paying attention to it. So think about it for a second. So uh, right before the climate uh, meetings and after the federal election, there was also another big rally in Ottawa where we made the 100% uh, and possible. Um, and um, you know, there's people all over Canada. We're still small, right? There's only Oxford County and Vancouver that have committed to do this, but you're not alone. You know, people came from Quebec, from all the provinces to be part of this demo. Um, and the one in Paris, the, what, the same thing was. Um, and if you need um, a little bit more, um, let me point out to you that uh, since we met last, a new group has created itself, which is a group of 100% renewable energy companies. So these are the, the companies that want to make 100% renewable energy possible. And I don't have time to talk about them very quickly. I just wanna show you whom they are. And if you go to this website, you can see what their plans are, what they're trying to do, how they're trying to do it. And I ran out of space there, uh, putting them up. <clears throat> but you, I'm sure, can even from, from the back see which some of these companies are. These are very big companies. And 
I don't want to pick one to give you an example because I'm not the mouthpiece of any company. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but it is pretty impressive that um, this is happening. So companies are doing it, leading jurisdictions like yours are wanting to do it. So the question that you need to ask yourself is, how do we do it, right? And I want to give you uh, uh, another uh, very, very good reference point um, that um, one of our students, uh, I think Nancy's coming back today, or the 31st, right, right? So Nancy is a master's student. She, she was in Europe recently, and what she's doing is she's taking the work that Kathy did and now looking at more detail how to go about this 100% renewable energy strategy. And in her, her research, she found that this place called Gusing in Austria, and those of you that are German speakers, please forgive my pronunciation, but uh, I think it's pronounced Gusing properly. And Gusing has done it. Um, that's what it looks like. Like Oxford County, it is a combination of rural and urban uh, environment. And what they did in Gusen is they look at how they use energy. And they say, look, we can calculate that every year we're exporting millions of dollars out of our community. What can we do to actually reverse that outflow of money that it's making us poorer to create jobs and economic advantage in our community? And you need to do this, or we need to do this same analysis right here in uh, Woodstock and Oxford County. Quick math, I know that uh, the population of Woodstock apparently is around 38,000. So let's go it up to 40,000. You know, I'll be 40,000 in the near future. And let's assume there's four persons uh, per family. So we could say that there's 10,000 families in Woodstock, give or take. If every family in Woodstock spending $5,000 a year in total energy costs, and I'm talking heating, electricity, the cars, blah, blah, well, that means that 10,000 families in Woodstock are spending close to $50 million a year that it's being exported out of your community. And in 10 years, that's half a billion dollars. And we need to be a little more precise about this um, I've done this research with my students at the university, and the range in their families is somewhere about $2,000 per year for a, a single person with one kid, all the way to $10,000 for big families that use a lot of wasteful machines. My point is, think about it for a minute. We are throwing that money away. We're paying uh, fossil fuel that burns the... Uh, uh, planet in a way, not just the engines. Um, and we should find ways to do this. And the people of Gisling, that's exactly what they've done. So what they've done is they say, let's create a cyclical strategy where we can actually use renewable energy for that purpose. And this, I realize, you cannot see beyond the first row. But basically what they're saying is the resources that we have are sun, wood, CO2, believe it or not, CO2, they see it as a resource. And what we need to do with these other resources, agricultural uh, inputs, etc., we need to use them to satisfy our needs. Notice that in Gisling, the wind option is not there. They don't have good wind resource. Um, and um, then what they've done is they've created a value chain uh, to be able to create local opportunities for themselves. So here you can see, for example, in relation to uh, uh, fuels, they, they take agricultural feedstock. So biomass, it's actually store sun energy in plants, right? And then they're finding a way to gasify it, and then they're using that gas for all kinds of things, power generation, you know, um, heating. Um, and Gissen, um, which is a small town, has managed to do that. And what they've done is they've mapped the entire area that where their community is. So picture this as perhaps change Gissen for Woodstock or Zora and uh, create then a map of the entire county. And what they're saying is we can service with thermal gasification, 
biomass fermentation, solar energy, district heating, and electricity, all the needs of not just Gusen, but the surrounding communities. And then what they've developed is a number of strategies to, to do that. Um, and the first thing they did is, which it's a very smart strategy that you should think about, is every facility that they've made, they've made it into a showcase for training and learning, not just to satisfy energy needs. And they began, for example, in 2004 and 2005, they received the Energy Globe Award for the work they were doing. So all of a sudden, the people of Gissin redirected all that money that was going to leave the community anyways to create local advantages. And then they start getting good at solar, good at gasification, biomass. And then all of a sudden, they start getting invited by everybody in the planet to present about what they're doing. And now this small Austrian region became very, very good at these things. And all of a sudden, the money that they were throwing away to buy fuel from uh, fossil fuel from somewhere else, they start redirecting. And they created um, this uh, center of technology, which is now one of the best research facilities in the world to come and do renewable energy research. Um, and now they are wealthy, and they're very notorious uh, in a good way. Um, and look, look what Schwarzenegger, the governor, had to say. Uh, he visited Gissing. Um, I know he's a little biased because he's Austrian, uh, I think, but he's also American. He was the governor of California, and he said the whole world should become Gissing. Um, I like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, he, he did a lot of renewable energy things in California, and you heard Josipa, no California, no efficient electric vehicles, no efficient vehicles. So then what happened, Gissen became so good at this that they start opening offices in every place that you see uh, a dot in that map. Um, so they have uh, Gissen, two locations in the United States, one in California, one in New York. They have in uh, Thailand, they have in Serbia. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight locations outside of this area that it's very similar to Oxford County. It took them a while, and this is the interesting part of the conversation. Gissing started doing these things when the technologies were very, very much on diapers. So now the big advantage for Oxford County is that the technologies are much, much more advanced. The prices, for example, of solar are much, much, much lower. So I wanted to show you this because remember the four titles of my presentation, uh, build it and they will come. Build it and you will prosper. And here you have empirical evidence of, of uh, a place that it's doing it and enjoying the benefits of doing the right thing. So now I wanna switch a few uh, um, uh, conversational pieces, put them on the table for you to think about. I have this equation that I presented before here, and I want to once again mention it to you. The strategy to achieve a sustainable Oxford County, in my opinion, it's based on uh, finding uh, the savings, saving them, and then reinvesting those savings to be able to have the best technology of the 21st century serve the needs of present and current generations. So, Efficiency and conservation is essential. And I was talking to Tyler in the break before uh, taking the podium, and he was explaining to me how they're doing, for example, LED lights in the streets. Um, he told me it's a no-brainer, right? You put an LED light in the street, you don't have to change it as often, um, and it uses way less electricity. And we had a really good conversation about efficiency. Solar solutions are extremely important as well. And nowhere better than uh, Jay Heeman to, to tell you what we can do with solar. Um, but um, I need to once again talk to you about combined heat and power and district energy because it's cold sometimes. You know, it was snowing today. So where will the heat come for uh, our homes, our buildings? Um, and the people of Gissen, I think, have a very good strategy for us to pay attention. We can grow the energy in Oxford County. 
we can gasify it, and then we can put it through combined heat and power machines and do district energy. Um, and the other aspect that is very, very important is something that I call renewable energy mobility, or uh, REM. This is not rapid eye movement, as you know, the type of sleep you want to have, or the band uh, that some old timers like me know that it's really good, REM, REM. But it's about taking electricity uh, from renewable sources to put it into vehicles. So let's talk a little bit about, I'm not going to talk too much about efficiency because you got a forte here on Tyler. Um, and uh, I just want to talk to you about what happens to the solar systems that we're making in Ontario. These are photos of the factories that make solar systems right here. Um, not in Oxford County, I don't think so, but uh, yes in Mississauga, yes in Toronto, yes in a few other places. This is what a modern uh, solar facility looks like. For us to be able to compete with Chinese made solar product, we need to have highly automated companies that can make very clean photovoltaic materials that then we can sell to the world because they're such good quality that people will prefer them over the, the um, I don't want to, well, okay, I already said it. But anyways, here's a, a little movie that shows you what folks in my community where I live right now are doing with uh, the solar systems that are made in Ontario. Um, so here you can see some um, commercial buildings. Um, those are just your average shipping and receiving buildings that now, instead of just being a storage place, they become actually a money-making place with uh, uh, solar. That's a, a school of the arts uh, that they decided to put solar. It's right by the city hall there in Markham. Um, this is the arena uh, eight blocks from my place. Um, and you can see a similar arena. I saw it right here when I was looking at this building, or it could be this building. So if you get in a drone or a helicopter, that is what you don't see. So it's a nice arena, looks like yours he there. Um, you don't have solar on the arena yet, do you? But it's a perfect place to put it, right? Because we use a lot of electricity in the arenas, right? And they, they're basically, can I say it, they're hogs of energy? Because making that ice costs money, um, so putting solar there makes sense. Having the solar made in your community and put in your community is the way to go. Um, this is another view of, of that. Um, and this is a, a school, just a local school that they solve two problems. They make their own electricity, which is good for the school. It's good to teach the children about solar. But also, before that solar installation, they had a huge air conditioning problem because the building had no overhangs and the sun was just beaming through the windows and the kids were uh, complaining about how uncomfortable they are. With proper calculus, you just get the right angle to get the summer sun out of the building and the winter sun into the building. It's all about the tilt of the overhang, but these are no ordinary overhangs. They're cheap overhangs because they cost less than the materials that we use commonly for overhangs. Don't believe me? Come and visit York University where we bought very fancy glass overhangs that don't make solar electricity. And here you can see my local, uh, well, it's not mine, I wish, but uh, the local Canadian tire looks like yours, you know, but when you look closer, it also has solar because Canadian tire, even though it has not become one of the, I was just giving the five o'clock. Okay, so this is a building that looks like um, uh, it has solar. Yes, it does have solar. Brand new building that does not use natural gas. Is this in Gissing? Is this in Germany? Is this in Denmark? No, it's right here off the 407 uh, in Markham. Um, and the building has a lot of solar and geothermal pumps, does not use one iota of natural gas. Uh, it heats and cools with ground heat pumps. Um, and the solar makes it into a net zero building. Lots of energy efficiency, good windows, good um, um, uh, uh, doors, insulation, etc. You make the geothermal system when you're making the hole for the building, the foundational. 
Um, and then you, you can see a little bit of the solar system. And what's interesting is across of that building, uh, they have this sign with solar that you may not see, but I make it big and you can see it. And it says coming soon here, and this is how they're selling this. They're saying lowest condo fees in Canada. And I know the builder of this is a friend called Dave, and uh, Dave told me that they're, they're basically printing money. And this last building in particular, 270 units sold in 10 hours and they have 900 other families waiting for the next building. Um, so he's in a very enviable position. Um, and um, there's the building, and I don't wanna, I have to finish now because uh, I was given the, um, I wanna talk to you very briefly in my last words about buildings, I'm, I'm very, it appeals to me from the technology perspective, but what about the existing buildings? What can we do with them? And I hinted I was going to talk a little bit about district energy uh, and combined heat and power, but I think you're going to have to invite me again. And what I want to talk to you is about uh, a, a very revolutionary approach, and I mean revolutionary in the RE evolutionary, so renewable energy evolutionary perspective, not revolution like that other type of revolution. So here is a group of people called the Center for Social Innovation. And what they've done is they've taken uh, buildings in downtown Toronto, um, and now they have three buildings that uh, they're operating. And in essence, what they do is they bring people that are working on different spectrums of innovation, sustainability, um, all kinds of different businesses to cohabit in the same building and do what a friend of mine calls co-inspiration. Turns out that if you locate people that are very creative in the same space, all kinds of incredible things start happening. And here you can see the 215 Spadina building. Um, my office used to be the one on the far corner, and I miss that every day because I had such a good time in that building. Um, and this is one of their new buildings in the annex. Um, and what I want to point out and conclude, because now I'm at one minute maybe, is um, does this look familiar to you? This belongs to you already. Uh, last time I checked, right? Uh, Trevor, is this yours? Does this belong to the city? So you have the exact same, exact same buildings, you know, that could be retrofitted just like you did it with the art gallery to become hubs of know-how. So use the wind farm you're building as a training facility and use your existing buildings to co-locate cultural creatives to become innovation hubs in agriculture, in renewable energy, in transportation. And um, the Center for Social Innovation, uh, it's fantastic. Um, this is the theory of change that they use. Everything is in their website. Um, I'm just gonna show you, the, the lady you wanna invite, it's in the middle. Her name is Tania, uh, the one on the black uh, clothes. She's the engine behind all of that with another lady called Margie. And let me conclude by saying that these ideas then have gone uh, to create the Spark Center in Whitby, um, the um, uh, Core 21 building, um, the Markham Convergence Center where I have uh, my new offices as of February 1st, um, and the Markham Convergence Center were using the same ideas of CSI to bring together the Chamber of Commerce, a Smart Commute, you know, renewable energy companies, such as the one that uh, we are creating. And York University is one of the tenants. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, I have a few more slides, but I'm already uh, extended. It's 2.55. You had me scheduled for three o'clock. I owe you a little talk about district energy, which I wanted to show you what my colleagues from, from Markham District Energy are doing. Uh, we got a new campus of York University we're building in Markham, and it will be powered by uh, Markham District Energy. Um, but at this point, if I'm allowed, the five last minutes, I would like to take any questions that you may have about the things that I've said or not said. Yes, sir. I love the vision of producing in Austria, um, and I fully understand the logic 
usually the first issue that comes up is where do you get the capital to start? So I guess that's the first qu that's my question. Where did they get the capital to start doing um, first of all the planning, but then which is not as much money needed, but then how to really put the district heating systems, the uh, gas conversion process, and all those different things, where'd they get the money? Now you realize that's a big question. But um, let, let's bring it down to the level of everybody. So when I bought our house, I've only bought one house, I'm not into flipping houses. And you know, I would have rather buy land and then build a solar house with the knowledge I have. But the bank wouldn't lend us money to do that, they say, no, 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 you want to do that, you buy a house like everybody else, and then the next one you can do that. Why is that? Because we did not have the land. So that's the first answer to your question. You have the land. Oxford County has the agricultural lands. Um, we've toured your county for three days. We know exactly what you have in terms of knowledge and lands. So that is the first part of the equation. When you have the land, it's very much easier to do things if you are landless. Um, take my example of uh, Spark or CSI. This is why I show you the photo of the art gallery. You were able to do that because you had that building. Building a brand new building costs much more, mu much more money than taking an existing building and retrofitting it for these purposes. Um, and the last part of your question, um, I would say right now we have a prime minister that promised that he was going to run deficits, not for one, not for two, but maybe for three years to be able to create economic stimulus. So I think it's incumbent on us in Oxford County to put together a plan that we can bring to Ottawa and say, look, you want climate protection? You want energy security, you want innovation, all the good things you're talking about, we're trying to do them right here. So make sure that we get the support we need to make it happen. So I think those three things is what I can say on the time I have right now. But I will say one fourth thing, uh, which is to do with, and this is the shame that I run out of time, because um, let me also answer it like this. So, you remember this picture of all the companies that are going 100% renewable energy? I can guarantee you that I will never be able to do what I did of showing it in little pieces. Because a year from now, this is going to grow exponentially. And here you have Oxford County, the Civic Hall, right? Josipa talked about that vehicle. We can talk why it got canceled. But what she forgot to mention is that it was made right here. That's a Woodstock plant. It was made right here in Woodstock. So the point of the story is that those companies and others are talking about making these type of factories. These are the factories of the present, not the factories of the future. This factory is being built as we speak in Reno, Nevada. Now you know why I was in Vegas. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's not yet done. And there's a person here, and I don't want to say who she is, that works for Tesla. And she can tell you she's seen the factories in California as of last week, I think. And these photos are a little old, but they're very advanced. Now the cuts out of the sack, that is the Tesla factory. And look at the numbers of the Tesla factory. They are planning to do, by 2020, 500,000 vehicles per year. Um, and the cell output of the gigafactory, it's going to be 35 gigawatt hours per year. So they're making batteries using solar. What is the main complaint of people on the media right now about industry is that electricity prices are too high in Ontario. We can't afford the electricity and business is going to go. Well, if you take the bull by the horns and say, we will make an, our own energy. And therefore, we can tell you, whomever company you are, that we can guarantee your prices of energy to be stable in weeks, months, years, and decades to come. Wouldn't they locate here? 
you've done it before, and it doesn't need to be tex Tesla. Um, this is an example of a company from Denmark called Roxul. Makes insulation, not as sexy as Tesla, but nevertheless necessary. And Roxul had to locate a North American plant somewhere. You know where this is located? It's in Milton. And why they got that plant in Milton was because they were able to get their act together to convince the Danish that this was way better than anywhere in the States. You got it all. You have peace and good government. You have a qualified uh, workforce. You got innovative politicians like Trevor. You have um, you know, the lands to do it and the experience with existing factories. Does that answer to your question? OK. Well, we can always keep talking about these things. So does anybody else have any other questions? Or uh, OK, thank you very much for your time. And um, we'll be in touch.